Okay, so our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Vago. Uh, he also um, uh, helped organize this conference, and to him I'm very grateful. He's a psychologist at Brigham's and Woman Hospital in Boston. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's really a privilege and honor to be here with all of you today. Um, and thanks, Sonia and Rael, for also helping to coordinate the conference. Um, I'm going to begin today to sort of weave a story that's been emerging um, with all the speakers uh, together as uh, a contrast between two models for how we are thinking about um, cultivating mindfulness. So what you see on one side is a 2,500-year-old model for cultivating mindfulness, which uh, is depicted here in a Tibetan Tonka painting. Uh, it's a beautiful depiction of uh, the stages of shamatha, uh, which I won't go into, but I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Um, and if you want, you can talk to me afterwards um, about it. Um, and contrasting that with the uh, more contemporary 25-year-old, approximately 25-year-old model, uh, of uh, um, John Kabat-Zinn's adaptation of Buddhist techniques for general stress reduction. Um, so keep in mind that the goal, really, for this uh, more contemporary model has been s general stress reduction, while as, whereas the 2,500-year-old the model, the, the goal has been enlightenment. Um, and so what we as researchers are, are trying to do is really attempt to integrate, as Joe was actually alluding to, integrate these two different models into um, uh, um, one sort of uh, um, way of investigating or drawing from the more historical models and uh, the more sort of contemporary medical models. Um, and what we'll realize is that there are very, very um, overlapping um, uh, goals as well. And so the framework I'm really describing today uh, focuses on addressing the major problem in the field right now, which is uh, essentially that uh, there is no uh, correct, single correct or authoritative uh, definition or operationalization of mindfulness. And so what we need to do is try to deconstruct it um, into uh, components that we're all familiar with in the sciences, like co cognitive, psychological, neurobiological, physiological, these types of things. And so that's where I'm coming from, and that's what I hope to move you um, through a little story today. So uh, I'll give you a few conceptual clarifications, talk to you a little bit about habit formation bias and what we mean by suffering, um, because this is where I think the two roads meet, the contemporary and historical. Um, talk to you a little bit about a variety of self-processing, because the framework that I use to investigate mindfulness is one that focuses on the self. So I'll have to give you a little background about what aspects of the self we're referring to and how we can localize that in the brain. And then what are the methods uh, for developing mindfulness? I think we, 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 you've sort of to get a little sampling of, of techniques today. And that's so wonderful to have a diverse group of, of practices to be exposed to, to give you a sense of w how mindfulness um, as a trait or a state can be cultivated, and we can get into some of these um, differences. And then uh, I do have um, some pilot data that uh, uh, is sort of hot off the press that I'd love to share with you today, so we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get to that. Okay. So, uh, and most of what I'm going to tell you today, uh, at least from the theoretical and conceptual level, comes from these two papers that um, are out there. So if you're interested, you can go to these papers and um, give you more detail. Okay. Okay, so what is mindfulness? Uh, that's sort of the big question. Um, I'm going to define it in broad terms here. You've seen a few other ways of operationalizing it. You've seen the contemporary definition that John Kabat-Zinn has given, um, although it's problematic in the laboratory setting because uh, of the uh, sort of the conflation with the term with other things like acceptance and uh, non-judgment and attention. Um, so what do, we, what do we really mean? Um, you know, what I do is I take a very broad, s paint with broad strokes here, and I, I talk about mindfulness as, um, from the Satipatthana Sutta, as sort of really referring to mindfulness as a path or a method of systematic mental training um, for reducing suffering and developing a sustainable, healthy mind. 
So if we use that as our broad framework, then we can put a lot of things into the pot and call it mindfulness because it's really all contributing to reducing suffering and, and, and sustaining a healthy mind. And mindfulness can also be a state, which we can refer to, at least in this context, as a mindful awareness. At least that's how I'm referring to it here. So we can make a distinction between mindful and awareness, which is the sort of more the uh, attentional component that is being trained um, and everything else that gets put together in the path or method that comes directly from the Satipatthana. So I like the, the picture of a brain with weights because that's really what we're doing. We're strengthening the mental muscle. And so I'd like to, you to keep that in mind as, as I go through the talk because in the end, some of the pilot data and some of what Fred was talking about, it all makes sense because that frontal lo those frontal lobes and, and what Rael was talking to, uh, uh, are very involved in uh, uh, controlling and regulating and helping develop a, a sense of uh, self-awareness and regulation. So um, because I focus on um, uh, the self, I'm going to give you a sense of what I'm, what I, what I'm referring to um, when I talk about self-awareness and regulation and transcendence. So self-awareness refers to this unbiased awareness of self and the world around oneself. So you see this uh, cat that's looking in the mirror and it sees a lion. Um, and uh, that could be problematic if the cat were to go out on the savannah and think it were um, going to you know, be the king of the jungle, so to speak. Um, so the point here is really to gain uh, an unbiased perspective of oneself and w uh, others around us. Um, Self-regulation re refers to, now if you saw the Tanka painting in the beginning, there was an elephant. And the elephant actually in, in, in that, in that um, model really dip, uh, is represents the mind. Um, and the idea in that, that Tanka painting is to actually uh, help tame the elephant. So because a, an elephant, when it's un, um, untamed, can be quite wild and, and wreak havoc. And that's the same sort of metaphor we're using here. So the ability, ability to ability tie to effectively <laughs> manage one's responses and impulses. And so that's what we're referring to as self-regulation. And there's a lot of uh, cognitive and psychological components that can fit into that bag as well. Uh, but this is really just a framework. So I'm really giving you a framework of how this all works. Um, and then we can go into better, more detail. Uh, the, 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 the component that I'm stressing as self-transcendence is, is often overlooked, um, uh, unfortunately, um, because a lot of times we focus a lot on, on, on quick fixes and we really want the attentional training, but we, we forget about the sort of the ethical components um, that a lot of us are alluding to, the loving kindness, the compassion, the sympathetic joy for our peers. It's so great when our peers get published, um, but often we, are, we have this greed and, or we have this jealousy that comes about. But that's, there's a really strong component of uh, transcending that sort of need that's part of this path for mindfulness. And what you see is a picture of, of a mother with her child. And nobody can deny the love that a mother has for their child. Um, and of course, that's what we're trying to uh, cultivate uh, as that much love that a mother has for its child to not only yourself um, and to your mother, um, but also to uh, the people around my mother's in the audience. So I thought I'd give her a little shout out there. But no, other you also want to... Have the you want to cultivate the love also for strangers, for all of us around us. We're all a community. We're all strangers, but in some sense, we're all connected. Um, but that love that you have is supposed to be um, transcendent from oneself and one's self-focused needs, um, and even to the people you dislike. So all of these components really make up what I'm referring to as the method uh, of mindfulness. Okay. So what is suffering? From the, the Buddhist model, and this is really, so this is the common thread that sort of ties the historical and contemporary models together, and it's the element of suffering. Um, both the medical model and Buddhism are trying to reduce suffering in some way, and that's where we can meet, and that's the greatest thing about um, having these dialogues is because we can meet at that, at least at that level. And the Buddhist model, and interestingly, there's some interesting uh, uh, overlap here. The Buddhist model really refers to the habitual attachment, the craving, and the aversion to sensory and mental events, the ignorance of impermanence, uh, that, there, that things arise and pass, um, and that the self is some independent and permanent entity based on really an inflated sense of self-importance or self-loathing. And the uh, Theravadan monk uh, Nyanaponika Thera um, 
states, the aims of these meditation practices are to achieve stability of mind, a deeply penetrating awareness between laxity and hyperexcitability, followed by a cessation of maladaptive emotions and cognitions, such as lustful desire, greed, hatred, worry, etc., the cultivation of virtuous qualities, and finally, the highest form of wisdom in which the practitioner perceives the most fundamental nature of objects as they truly are, and here's the key component here, without distortion or, bi or biases inherent in habitual forms of cognition. Okay, now something's going to seem familiar when we look at the more contemporary model, and there's Aaron Beck. He is sort of the father of uh, um, psychotherapy, or really, the sorry, the cog cognitive model of psychopathology. And what he says uh, is that the processing of external events or internal stimuli is biased and therefore systematically distorts the individual's construction of his or her experiences, leading to a variety of errors. Seemingly, it's sounding familiar, right? Um, there's distorted interpretations um, that become dysfunctional beliefs, and they, they become incorporated into crystallized or enduring cognitive structures or schemas. Um, let's see. So, whoops, going backwards. Um, and so he, he created this uh, diagram here, which is a developed model of depression. So he really focuses on uh, sort of the psychopathological psychopath model of bias. Um, and what happens is if there's some sort of adverse developmental experience in our, in our life, if some we all have some uh, adverse experiences, but depending on how you deal with them, they can turn into enduring uh, attitudes and schemas that are crystallized um, that activate the stress uh, components of sympathetic nervous system and so on and so forth and these become exaggerated over time um, and uh, you have this dominance of limbic activity over prefrontal function which I'll, I'll get, uh, ba get back to um, and that leads to depressive symptoms I'm just going to stress that dominance of limbic activity over prefrontal um, uh, activity because this is sort of the, the the model of psychopathology if you see limbic activity that's high, amygdala, hippocampus being highly active, and prefrontal activity being low, you can assume that that person has some sort of psychopathology. There are, there are certainly exceptions. So here's the me. This is me. This is you. Um, and so we begin with the assumption that our perception and cognitions related to our ordinary experiences are distorted and biased to some varying degree. Um, and so, um, but what I want to stress is that it works at the very perceptual level and the cognitive level, so at so the evaluative level. And these are different time courses. So Rael really nicely gave us a timeline of how these effects are present. We have things that are at 300 milliseconds after you see something. That's when you actually first have your first thought about it. So up to then, you're having all these non-conscious types of things that involve perception. And perception works at a non-conscious level. Also, you also can say that you see something, but at that point, it's already cognitive. So it, keep in mind that, that what I'm talking about is bias at both perceptual and evaluative level, and we can look at both of those. Okay, so m over time, if our perception and, uh, and cognitions are biased, then the self uh, becomes conditioned um, uh, in, in s through feedback. It's modulated by your current state. Your current state is modulated either by your negative or positive interpretation. And so what you're left with is your slice of reality. Um, and what you see is just a sliver of what everyone else sees. And what we're trying, we're aiming to, to do is to sort of remove those distortions through these practices. Okay, so uh, both Beck and the Buddha would probably agree about how these biases arise. Um, and Aaron Beck will, will talk about it, at a, again, at an extreme level. Now, it doesn't have to be a psychopathological model. People can have these distortions. We all have distortions. We all have biases, whether you have depression or not. But this is a depression, depression model. If you're talking about yourself continuously as I am worthless, uh, life is unfair, and my future is hopeless, um, this, these types of perceptions and cognitions about yourself in the world lead to dysfunctional attitudes, uh, rumination, and negative self-focus. So that is really what creates a reification of, of your narrative, who you are, when you reflect upon yourself uh, in the past. Because um, what you see, really, is your past, and is your future, every time you reflect back. You can be thinking about yourself in a negative way. And so that there's no way to sort of correct this unless we unravel the complete 
um, reification that you've created over time. And so how do we do the unraveling? Well, before we get there, I'm going to give you uh, at least the framework for self and how we can look at the self um, conceptually and in the brain. So here's our cat again. Um, and the cat can have various experiences. Uh, it looks in the mirror and it sees the lion, right? So it's distorted there. So it can have an experience of I am, I was, I will be. Um, and this is sort of an evaluative or narrative aspect of self-processing. Now, every aspect of self-processing that I'm referring to in these boxes has its own specific neural substrates, and I'll, I'll get into uh, providing you those. Then there's seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, feeling. These are the senses. This is being in the present moment, experiencing sens sensations and perceptions as you are experiencing them in the present moment. Um, then you have uh, experiences of that is mine. This is me acting or my action. When you look at your body, uh, you know that that is you and not someone else. Um, and so this is a uh, sense of agency or ownership. And this is where there you create. This is the first part of your own self-experience where you've now made a distinction between yourself and someone else. That you can see that that is my arm out here and not someone else's. And of course, there's disorders where people deny the fact that they have an arm and that's not my arm. Um, um, but w the most interesting findings I'll just allude to um, that you see in literature at currently is you start to see very distinct differences between self and other uh, when you give, say, a list of adjectives of uh, yourself versus someone you, um, you don't know, like the Queen of England or someone stranger. Okay, and that's like the typical task. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the same brain areas, if you're watching, say, your mother, I'll use my mother ex as an example again, if you're watching your mother experience pain, um, and if you have a good relationship with your mother, um, which I, I think we do, um, then your brain areas should actually look very similar um, when you're looking at yourself experiencing pain or you're experiencing pain yourself or uh, you are watching your mother experience pain. And, and Josh Grant can probably clarify some of these things a little later. Um, but what the, the, the interesting thing there is what I'm trying to make a point is that uh, that if it was a stranger experiencing pain, it looks different. Your brain areas actually are not as overlapping anymore. And I think what we're trying to do is develop a so this level of self-transcendence in which there is no longer that difference between how you see your how your brain experiences pain for yourself or other. I'll just make that statement. Okay. Then there's also the meta awareness, so metacognition, knowing that you're aware, and that's the uh, fourth level of self that we're talking about. And the last one, of course is the stuff that's going on under the hood, the non-conscious stuff, the stuff that you're not aware of. It happens. It's just making things uh, happen without your awareness. And this is where I think we're starting to see the field move. We're starting to look at more non-conscious aspects of self-processing that uh, uh, are affected by meditation practice m at the subtlest levels of perception. Okay, so there's the self. Now let's talk about the brain. And don't be scared by pictures of the brain. Um, I won't let I won't make you memorize or anything. It's just I'm just showing you pictures with little letters on them, and and they all just really represent. Th pay attention to just the colors. So in this case, green represents a evaluative uh, sense of self, the narrative that I was referring to. Um, and remember, I just gave you all the aspects of self-processing. Now we're just mapping it onto the brain. Um, and so there have been a lot of studies that. Um, put the narrative within a particular network of structures. And it does just turn out that the network that lights up mostly when we're doing nothing at rest is this network. So what does that mean? It just means that we're constantly ruminating or self-reflecting about the past or trying time traveling into the future about what we're going to do next. Okay. Then there's the phenomenological sort of self, which is the experience of now. Um, and so it involves uh, a few more um, more lateralized structures in, in the frontal cortex um, and uh, temporal pole, pole and superior temporal sulcus. I'm not going to bother you with names, just yellow structures. And there's one here uh, at the bottom called the AIC, which has also been really heavily inf uh, uh, involved in uh, present moment experience, which is the insula, a really interesting structure. Okay, and then we have the stuff that's going on under the hood, the non-conscious stuff. So what we have now are sort of three networks of brain areas that are been highly 
um, uh, defined in the literature. Um, they're very clearly defined that you have this hippocampal cortical memory system, you have these more experiential sort of uh, uh, sensory um, uh, areas, and then you have these more non-conscious areas that are responsible for orienting your attention, um, for uh, guiding your eye movements, um, very non-conscious subtle things. And then lastly, we have an integrated network, um, a network, a frontal parietal control network, which which basic job, now these are the orange structures, and so the, the basic job of this network is really to integrate the information and improve the efficiency, efficiency uh, of activation between those other three uh, 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 networks. So it's enhancing the communication between the experiential and the narrative. So it's uh, not necessarily the case where uh, meditation uh, is trying to enhance just experience and, and push away all your memories. Uh, it's okay to have memories. Um, it's just going to be more well integrated with our ex direct experience. And so what we're seeing actually in most of the literature is that the orange areas uh, and the yellow areas are be growing in size and more active during most of these meditative practices. So as a result of doing these meditative practices and um, uh, during these meditative practices, you see activation of the yellow and orange. And that really says something very clearly to us. Um, I'll let you make that conclusion. Okay, so how do you get mindfulness? Uh, we've talked about some of these practices, so I'm not going to get into them, but I will focus on one um, because uh, you know I, I tried to, in, uh, in one of my papers, I tried to model each one of these and map those neurocognitive comp components onto each one of those types of practices. So I'm going to focus just on the open monitoring practice just to walk you through it quickly. Okay, so, um, so basically... Um, the open monitoring practice is a receptive practice, it, and all the practices begin with a framework that I've created uh, as motor learning. The idea behind motor learning is a framework for um, uh, implicit types of processing. So riding a bike. How do you ride a bike? How did you learn how to ride a bike? You just got on it and tried and tried and tried and tried, and you got better, and now you don't even have to think about it, right? Okay, so that's the framework we begin with. And then you start with this level of uh, intention and motivation. Um, and so um, that intentional drive is to sustain the practice through sort of internally driven uh, mean. And that's really important because if you don't have this, you're not going to get the benefits. So intention and motivation are something we can study and we're doing that. Um, and that's uh, sometimes uh, uh, overlooked. And then you're given a set of instructions. How do you practice? You have to keep those instructions in mind. Um, and that requires some executive functioning, which is a uh, frontal lobe function. And as we continue, you develop some form of ambient attention. And what I mean by ambient attention is that your attention is diffuse towards whatever arises. Um, and you keep these types of uh, instructions in your mind through working memory. And, and Rael showed how working memory improves. And there's been a few other studies that show working memory improves as well. And then you're alert and you're orienting to whatever arises. And you can mentally note and label them in very specific modalities. Uh, for example, here I, I illustrate visual, auditory, and somatic, and they can be, um, you, can, you can note the arising of the, of the experience, you can note the presence of it, uh, or you can note the passing of the experience. As you become more trained in these practices, you can really start to get into the higher resolution of, of noting and labeling every aspect of sens sensory things that come through your mind. And you can also note the rest or the absence of that, the calmness, that there is no internal mental chatter or there is no visual information. And that just goes right, y what you do is you note it, you label it, and you disengage and you start again. And that's the practice. Um, but we all know that's not the whole story and that we have some sort of emotion that comes up with some sort of valent, positive, negative, neutral. Um, it's usually some emotion uh, or memory that arises and that becomes habitual and we call that uh, rumination. So we all know that feeling as soon as you close your eyes. We probably all experienced it this morning. Um, and that's what happens. That's what we do. But um, how do the, the critical component that allows us to disengage from that rumination and go back to what we're supposed to be doing um, is unclear. 
Um, and it actually may be a common component for all forms of, of, of uh, um, cognitive behavioral treatment. Um, um, but what we call it uh, um, decentering. And we think it's critically involved in a monitoring function. Um, uh, some people refer to this as diffusion or reperceiving, things like this. But the idea is that your monitor, your executive monitor that's uh, being meta-aware of everything is strengthening. And through that strengthening, you're able to disengage from the, the rumination and go back to the beginning. You're inhibiting your responses. You're regulating your emotions. These are very highly frontal uh, executive types of functions. And this develops equanimity, so you can uh, uh, disengage completely from the object of your attention and really just go right back to the beginning. And this helps. So what happens, I have effort built in here too, which means as you continue to grow in your practice, the effort decreases. Okay, I'm not going to dwell too much. I'm going to focus a little bit on the rest state, though. Um, sorry. So, so I did a study which um, looked at specific. Now, what I'm trying to do now is trying to map all of these components, um, basically mapping the meditative mind. Um, and we've used, uh, collaborated with uh, a Buddhist teacher named Shinzen Young. Um, and here's the group, all like uh, standing in front of our lab. And in the bottom, you see them meditating. And we had them come in. Um, there are 15 of them. We had them sit um, for a week, uh, basically do a retreat. And they had a, um, there was a, a large group of them, so they had very levels of expertise. And that was important for us because we wanted to look at whether hours of practice and experience had any uh, um, correlation with the effects that we were going to look at. So remember, we're focusing on these rest states. Um, and uh, I'll just move forward. So his system of mindfulness is very analytical. Um, he has a way of just mentally noting and labeling everything. Um, and um, I'm not going to get into all the details, but what I will say is that he focused on these uh, aspects of rest. And I'll just describe to you what they all mean. So see rest refers to focusing on sort of the grayscale blank and replacing the mental imagery uh, uh, that arises naturally. Hear rest focuses on the absence of the inner speech. Feel rest focuses on the visceral somatic relaxation. And do nothing is like a choiceless awareness um, type of practice where it's an effortless sustaining of awareness and clarity of mind without explicit intentional selection. Um, and I can try to clarify those things to you more if you want. You can reach me afterwards. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you the data. So there's Shenzhen in the scanner. Um, uh, unfortunately, we, we really wanted to, uh, you know, image him, and he helped us with the, with the developing the protocol. But his brain's a little old, and you know, we have, it, honestly, in brain imaging research, after 40 years old, I'm sorry to say, um, we don't really want to look at your brains anymore because, uh, and that's that's a problem because a lot of meditators, it takes so long for you to become an expert. Uh, we're over 40 to be all the most mostly experts were over 40. <laughs> Under 40 is useless. Well, so uh, our oldest was 55. It atrophies, unfortunately. Your brain atrophies. You start to lose brain cells. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's just the game. Um, so uh, it's hard to make comparisons because the standards in imaging are based on 20-something-year-olds, uh, the standard brain. And if we start to make comparisons between you know, an advanced meditator of 65 who's atrophied somewhat, now let's l we should paraphrase that by saying that Meditation is shown to uh, uh, to reduce the cortical atrophy r that's uh, associated with aging, so that's one positive thing about doing it. But uh, it's not good enough, at least, to make those comparisons. We want it to be very clean with our data. So, 55 was our max. Okay. So um, again, don't be scared of brain pictures. I will just walk you through it really quickly. Um, the idea here is the take home that I really want you, and I'm only showing you uh, one uh, analysis that we did. Um, it w was the most striking one. It was the one that looked at uh, these states, all these states that I referred to, that I told you about, um, comparison to a discursive mind wandering technique. And we know the problems with meditators and mind wandering. They don't like. They don't know how to do it really well, uh, especially advanced meditators. So you have to give them some help. Um, but in any case, that was our contrast, which is a it was a typical contrast. And what we found was that there was a very strong effect of frontal activation uh, across all areas of the frontal lobe, especially frontal polar areas, the dorsal and ventral lateral, 
um, um, BA9, BA10, um, 46, 47, all these different areas of frontal cortex were highly active and without any emotional stimuli present, their limbic system was suppressed. But the big but here is that that effect was only present when we correlated the group means with hours of meditation experience. So the more hours of meditation experience that, that their practitioners had, the more frontal activity that was present and the more decreases or suppression of the limbic activity that there was. So that was a striking take home message. Um, of course, each modality had very unique uh, aspects of activation too. Um, so for do nothing, um, let's see, I think I even wrote them down, there we go. Um, there was uh, um, increases in ACC and even PCC, um, decreases in um, cerebellum and brain stem. Um, uh, there's some, so we, we're trying to interpret these th results still, um, and it's really just hot off the press, so we haven't quite gotten to the interpretation stage, but what is very clear were the biggest effects, which was the frontal uh, limbic story. Um, C-REST had uh, um, very uh, in increases in, I uh, can't do both, but. And then let's see, in uh, here rest, those increases in the visual areas decreased. And what we did see, which was unique to here rest, was increase in the right inferior frontal gyrus, which is the homologue to Broca's areas on the left side, uh, which has been involved in uh, sort of uh, uh, inhib inhib inhibitory processing. So there may have been something very sort of unique to sort of way of processing and sort of uh, in the inhibitory processing of internal mental chatter that's coming in there. And feel rest um, gave us our insula um, that we were looking for. Um, it, it was increases in um, uh, uh, anterior insula on both sides. Um, so that so again, we have a very um, uh, nice story to tell that that really gives us sort of dose effects of meditation um, that has very uh, strong frontal control um, mechanisms, and it fits into our model. And we hope to continue doing this, uh, mapping the meditative mind, and sort of get a sense of how all these states fit onto that model. So, uh, conclusions. Mindfulness is a method for improving self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence. It can be cultivated by specific techniques that uh, we refer to. And that initial data provide preliminary support for one, the model that we proposed, and that the specific functional and anatomical substrates that we saw were uh, important for stable attention and affect uh, across multiple modalities and in comparison to non-meditation default states of rest. The most striking part of that is that there was no emotional stimuli present. That's when you normally see this type of suppression or regulation. It was just meditation. Okay, so I have to thank uh, uh, everyone uh, in our lab um, uh, uh, at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital and the Impact Foundation for supporting us and Shinzen Young for really working with us together. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much.